You know, there's that famous Einstein quote about you can't solve problems with the same kind of thinking that created them in the first place. And so that gives you the opportunity to wonder, well, how does the way we think create problems when we're trying to solve problems? And it does seem that as we create prob as we solve try to solve our problems, we create new problems. And, and then the next question is, what does it mean? What does he mean when he says that kind of thinking? What is the kind of thinking where we, wherein you try to solve problems and you wind up creating new ones? So this talk is about, this talk is about that. It's about trying to get at the meaning of that quote and see how can we apply it in our lives. So this presentation is about a methodology. Um, over the last eight years, I've been shown, we've all been shown, I think, but I'm the one that wrote it down, uh, a methodology for dealing with abstractions having to do with human being. And because, and, and related to the Einstein quote, it's a methodology for dealing with human being such that we can find out what kind of thinking produces more problems when we try to solve our problems and moving beyond that. So that we can find a way of being in the world that empowers us to live happy and joyful and satisfying lives. So we have the fish. Y'all remember the fish probably. Um, he's swimming in a container called the ocean. He's never been outside of that container. He spent his whole life in that container. And so everything that he's ever looked at has been through the water. He would have no way of knowing what it might be as we do to look at something without the medium, without the intervening medium of water. Now his ocean consists largely of water. And I say largely because the water has stuff dissolved in it. It has impurities, we could say. Salt, silt, organic matter, that sort of thing. And those impurities interfere with his view of whatever he's looking at. So, or, or maybe not interfere, but they color or shade or otherwise influence whatever his view of whatever he's looking at. Well, we live in an ocean too. That's us, those, those eyes, that represents us. And um, we've never been outside that ocean either. And so everything we've ever looked at has been through that ocean, through that medium that we are submerged in or immersed in. And our ocean consists of our beliefs consists of everything we know, everything we think we know about ourselves, about each other, and about how the world works. Everything that we know is dissolved, is, 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 uh, constitutes the ocean that we're submersed in and that we look at everything through. And, you know, the fish doesn't really look at the water he doesn't look at the water and we don't look at our beliefs. We typically look at whatever we're looking at through our beliefs. And we don't notice the effect that our beliefs have on what we're looking at. We think we're just looking at it and we see it the way it is. So our ocean of understanding has impurities dissolved in it and those impurities act to distort or otherwise interfere with our view of whatever we're looking at. Those impurities consist of misunderstandings, mistaken ideas, things we were told by people who didn't know any better. We were taught language and social skills and the folks who taught us those things were well-meaning, I'm assuming, and they didn't know better. They didn't know different, let's put it that way. So they passed on those impurities to us, those mistaken ideas mistaken beliefs. Now, some of those mistaken ideas are fundamental. Some of them are trivial. You know, whatever your mother told you to do at the dinner table, 
I'm calling that trivial. But her worldview, my mother's worldview, which she passed on to me, wasn't trivial. The ground of being that she passed on to me, what's possible, what's available, what's not possible, what's expected of me. Some of those fundamental mistaken ideas rise to what I call superstition. So let's talk about what is a superstition? So this is the, um, this is the definition that I wrote down. A superstition is a belief or practice resulting from ignorance, fear of the unknown, or a false conception of causation. That's what the dictionary says. So black cats are bad luck or a black cat crossing your path is bad luck. What does that mean? Well, there's an idea of causation there. So you see a black cat crossing your path and somehow that's gonna cause you to have bad luck. And I think that fits the definition here a false conception of causation. And the other thing about superstitions is, uh, I want to clear this up right away. When we use the word, when I use the word superstition, it's often something we ascribe to somebody else. Somebody else is superstitious. We don't ordinarily think of ourselves as being superstitious. One kind of person that comes up when I hear the word superstition is baseball players. Uh, you've probably all seen baseball players. You know, they wear these hats all the same. They're called rally caps. And, and it's fun. It's trivial. It's fun. I know those baseball players don't really think that wearing those baseballs on top of their hats is going to cause them to win the game. I, I wanted to present three classes of superstitions. So the first one is a trivial superstition. This is a trivial superstition, what I call a trivial superstition. They're just fun or something to laugh at at somebody else. Now, the second kind of superstition I wanna talk about is what I call a consequential superstition. There's a consequence to believing it. And then the, and, and, and those are a little bit harder to see, but we can see them. And we'll take a look at the most effective way of dealing with a consequential superstition. And the final category that I came up with is an ex existential superstition. An existential superstition dominates one's life and has fundamental consequences to the believer. And we'll look at that as well. So the black cat thing, it's ordinarily regarded as a trivial superstition, but you can imagine, you, I think we can all imagine believing in that superstition that black cats crossing your path are bad luck. Um, you can imagine walking down the sidewalk on a busy street and there's a black cat there and you might cross the street to not have that black cat cross your path. So you might cross the street and get hit by the bus that's coming down along. And that would be a consequential superstition. It would have consequences. How would you free yourself from a trivial superstition? You just acknowledge that you know it's a superstition. You acknowledge it as a superstition and you laugh at it in yourself if that is called for. Something that you know is a superstition has no power over you. Um, Werner Erhard once said, uh, superstitions only have power when they're not superstitions. <clears throat> and what he meant by that is that when you know it's a superstition, it has no power. When it's not a superstition, when it's the way it is, now it has power. So again, the way to free ourselves from superstitions is to recognize them as superstitions. And with trivial ones, that's pretty easy. And another way to think about it is, if you tell that story, black cats crossing your path are bad luck, that 
sort of puts this, not sort of, that puts the superstition out there into the world and adds credence to it. And we'll talk a little bit about how we do that, probably not with black cats, but with other things. On the other hand, you can change the story about the black cat as Groucho did. A black cat crossing your path signifies that the animal is going somewhere. <laughs> So he was having fun with that, but it's an, it exemplifies changing the story, changing the story that you tell about the superstition. All right, so those are our trivial superstitions. Let's move on to consequential superstitions. And I think it's easiest to look at a consequential superstition in the past. We'll get to the present in a minute, but we can look at it in the past. Here's an illustration of what was a consequential superstition. People believed that that line out there where the sky meets the ocean was an edge. And it was frightening to think about an edge and falling off the edge. Now, that was a superstition, but people didn't know it was a superstition. They couldn't identify it as a superstition. And it was consequential. People didn't fall off the end of the earth kind of consequence, but it narrowed the opportunities and the options for commerce. You couldn't sail out there with your load of cargo. You had to go around here and, you know, you couldn't just stand on the beach in Portugal and outfit the Santa Maria and the Nina and the Pinta and go that way, not yet. Not when you believed that that was real. Later on, it was recognized to be a superstition. Now, how would you free yourself from a consequential superstition? Anybody? What is the class of thinking? What is the kind of thinking? Let me ask the question differently and then I'll call on you, Richard. What is the kind of thinking that allows you to deal with a consequential superstition? Yes. Well, you'd have to uh, challenge the basic premise and go. Yeah, exactly. And go over the edge. Yeah, exactly. I would say that there's a long-standing, well-developed methodology for dealing with consequential superstitions. It's called rationality and logic. And it often requires courage. I mean, the first guy, probably a guy in those days, uh, who said, okay, I'm sailing out there anyway, and I'm gonna find that edge. And realized that as he sailed away from land, the edge did too. Oh, that's different. That, mm, and that has an implication for the world. It has an, sure. yeah, absolutely. So it required courage, but the methodology for dealing with consequential superstitions is rationality and it works pretty well. So um, I'd like to invite a little bit more audience participation. I'd like to see if you guys can think of consequential superstitions that perhaps some people believe now. And the way you'd be able to identify those is by knowing that, by you knowing that they're superstitions and that for other people, it's real. Anybody have any ideas? I'll show you my list and then I'll ask you again. You know, I, my grandmother told me long, long ago that um, my grandfather was working in the coal mines and when he saw a black cat cross his path, he turned, when he was walking to work, he turned around and came home. <laughs> and uh, I think kind of what we got now is some of the superstition around the pandemic. Can you can you give us a sentence like the pandemic is or like that has fear, the word is in it? Well, let's go with the fear of the vaccine is a superstition that has huge consequences for the planet, for the humanity. Great. How about vaccines are dangerous? Yes. Or this vaccine is dangerous. Yes. By the way, if, if I can tell you a little joke, 
um, we ordered a washing machine and we have to wait till October to get the washing machine because there aren't enough chips to go in the washing machine. You know where all the chips went? What? Some, some people think there's, some people think some there's chips, chips in the vaccine. There's always that word is in a consequential superstition. It is that way, as opposed to some people think that way, or I used to think that way, but I don't think that way anymore. Something like that. Okay. Well, here's my list. Love is dangerous. If you see it on love is dangerous that's a that, that's a good one too thank you if you see it online it must be true some folks believe that rich people are that way because they pinch their pennies they what they pinch their pennies the, so the statement would be rich people are that way they are rich because they restrict the outflow of their funds and that has consequences that that superstition has consequences and uh, does anybody i bet there's at least one person in here who's, who subscribes to that one you don't have to identify yourself maybe we all do to some degree how about carrots and sticks are the only way to get people to do what you want them to do in other words, the only two ways to get somebody to do what you want them to do is to entice them or to threaten them. If conditions aren't to your liking, you aren't trying hard enough or cleverly enough to change those conditions. That's a very common consequential superstition. Living in the bubble. So uh, I gave a talk about living in the bubble once in this room. But a lot of it, I hear that a lot about being in the Mid Valley or being in Carbondale. Well, here we are in the bubble. You know, there's a lot of chaos and a lot of craziness going on in the world, and there isn't a whole lot of it here. And so the superstition I'm saying is that living in the bubble is a geographical thing. In other words, it has to do with, with this particular here. And the last one that I wrote down is that power and force are the same thing. So that we use the word power as in they have power over me. That's not power, that's force. Power is the ability to live your life your way. And uh, I... Uh, I, I wrote down a note here to, it says, notice that the ones you can list are typically the ones you've discovered are actually superstitions. Okay. Now let's talk about existential superstitions. Almost any answer we can give to the question, what am I, will turn out to be an existential superstition because the word what conjures an object. It conjures a thing distinguished from the background. Can you expand on that? We learn as, in, as very young humans to distinguish objects from the background. Initially, when we open our eyes, you can probably visualize this. Everything is just a mass of color and brightness or lack thereof. It takes practice to begin to distinguish objects from the background and the foreground from the background and all of those distinctions that we take for granted. So almost any answer to a question that starts with what will conjure an object some kind of thing that you're distinguishing from everything else. And almost any answer to that question, what am I, will turn out to be an existential superstition because we're not things, we're not objects. I mean, visually it appears that I'm an object among objects. We've learned to see the world that way. I gave a talk about that too here. 
the idea that I am an object, let's say a body with consciousness inside it, or a personality, or an identity, is a superstition. Now, there's a, a class of existential superstitions, and there's a one. There are some fundamental superstitions among those. Among those, and one that I singled out for this morning is. Our lives are contained within a world that existed before we got here, will exist after we're gone, and doesn't care about whether we're here or not. I am proposing that that is a fundamental existential superstition, that our lives are contained in a world that was here before we got here and will be here after we're gone. And by the way, it's consequential in that it leaves us relatively powerless with respect to the world and its doing. When you think of yourself a, as an object among other objects, those objects can impinge upon you. They can get in your way. They can attack you. For most of humanity throughout the ages, that statement is not a superstition. It's the way things are. So, Uncovering a superstition. Uh, I, I chose a picture here of the Pinta and the, what is it, the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria because those guys were not way, and they were just an example, but those guys were not blocked in their travels by the superstition that that's an edge out there that they could fall off of. And when they set out from Portugal, they knew that. They knew it was a superstition. Now, how those guys knew that, I'm not sure. I don't have that historical background. So freeing yourself from a trivial superstition requires only honesty and sometimes laughter. Freeing yourself from a consequential superstition requires rationality and logic, honesty, and a bit of courage. But how do you free yourself from an existential superstition? Rationality and logic have not proven their worth in that area. And that's what gives rise to the Einstein quote that I started out with. You can't solve problems with the same kind of thinking that created those problems in the first place. And the kind of thinking he was talking about or that I think he was talking about is rationality and logic. They're very effective in their domain, but they're not very effective in the addressing of, of existential superstitions. So maybe we can find out what is required. So let me go back to quantum theory for a minute. The word quantum is bandied about in spiritual circles. You'll hear it a lot. If you go on YouTube and you download videos that have something to do with why we all are here in this room and something to do with what happens and what is in this room. You'll hear the word quantum a lot, quantum ideas, the quantum viewpoint. Well, what is that? Let me tell you all you need to know about quantum theory. Quantum theory is a story about the relationship between the world and the observer. Now, it took me, what, 10 seconds to say that? And it took me three years to get the master's degree. So there was a lot of stuff that I had to wade through. And then, let's see, from 1969 to here, so maybe 40, 40 50 years, <laughs> whatever it is, it took me to get here from that. Uh, I was going to show you a picture of a typical blackboard in a quantum physics class, but I decided not to. But quantum theory is the most powerful theory we have to explain our observations of the universe. It's a mathematical, it, its mathematical formulation has never proven itself wrong as far as we quantum physicists know. It's a very powerful theory. 
But that story denies the existence of a durable, physically real world independent of its observation. In other words, that theory came about because people were trying to explain their observations because their observations didn't seem to fit within the idea that there's a world out there, whether we're looking at it or not. But see, virtually everybody believes in that independent world. Most of the time we go out that door and go around our business believing in the reality that there's an independent world out there. And then when it doesn't show up the way we want it to, it's not our fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's bad luck. It must have been a black cat someplace. But if you trust quantum theory, which I guess is easy for me to say because I studied it for several years, but uh, without quantum theory, your smartphone wouldn't work. The GPS wouldn't work. A lot of stuff wouldn't work without quantum theory. So you actually do trust it because you use devices that were created by people that understood it as much as anybody understands it. If you trust quantum theory, you have to consider that durable independent world a superstition. But rationality alone won't get you there. So if rationality alone won't get you there, what does? Uh, I'm back to my what am I question. I, I thought I would do a little bit of a reading from Hoodwinked, from our new book, Hoodwinked, whose subtitle, by the way, is Uncovering Our Fundamental Superstitions. So, um, this is just two selections that I took from the book. I can't tell you what page number they're on. You have to read the book to find it. I call something that has an independent existence an is, like it is that way. The existence of the world as an is, is a superstition. If you really consider what quantum theory tells us, I think you'll realize that the world isn't an is, but is rather what we might call an appears as, like the horizon that appears to be the edge off of which you could fall. The world appears to be permanent and stable, and it appears to be real. But so did the edge that the mariners used to see when they looked at the horizon and were afraid of falling off it. The existence of that edge turned out to be a superstition. Okay, the existence of the world as something apart from us might be a superstition. What about us? Are we real or are we a superstition? As I've said before, when we open our eyes and look at the world as it is, we see ourselves and each other as physical objects, bodies placed in a context called the world. In terms of my inherited belief system, the one I inherited from my parents, my physical identity ends at a boundary called my skin. If I identify myself with my body, then I conclude that who I am ends there as well. Is that a real distinction between myself on the one hand and everything and everybody else I see on the other? We take that distinction for granted, but does it hold up under scrutiny? Probably the strongest argument for it in an experiential sense is that most of us have physical sensations and motor control as a result of nerve ending stimulation throughout the volume of space occupied by our bodies. Most of us would also say that we have neither sensations nor motor control beyond these boundaries. We take that as evidence that that idea that we end here and she begins there and we're separate objects get the idea however my study of the relationship between the world and the observer caused me to abandon the idea of space 
as the ultimate context or container of our lives and replace it with awareness. In my awareness, in my experience, there is only here when considering location. No one has ever experienced there. Every time you move your body to a location you previously considered to be there, you then find yourself here. It is impossible to experience there. Now, let me say that there certainly exists as, as an idea, as a concept, but it does not exist within the domain of experience of what is truly real. When you learn to view the world from the vantage point of what is truly real, the idea you previously thought of as out there disappears as a real place. It isn't real. Out there isn't real. It's an idea. It's a concept. The conventional understanding I received from our shared culture requires that I think of myself as an object among objects with all that implies. I'm suggesting the possibility that the distinction we all make between me and not me on the physical level is artificial. If all that I see, hear, touch, taste, and smell is part of a story I've learned to tell, it's all me. The idea that there is something out there, something that's not me, would in that context turn out to be nothing more than a superstition. It's all me. And by extension, it's all you. There's nothing out there. There is no out there except as a concept. So when you, by the way, when I use the word you, I'm talking to all the human beings in this room, including this one. When you assign blame, you're giving away your power. I don't care whether you're blaming circumstances or somebody else or your upbringing or the warming of the planet or whatever, when you blame something, you're giving away your power. That's all there is to it. It's real simple. So what are the consequences of an existential superstition? I am an object distinguished from the background or environment is a superstition with enormous consequences. If you're an object, you will wind up feeling you're in competition with somebody else. If you're an object, you can be threatened by or in danger from anyone or anything else. If you're an object, you can be at the effect of anyone else's decisions or preferences, and you can be at the effect of circumstances or conditions. If you're not an object, if all there is is you, all of that goes away. All of those consequences that I listed there are depend on the superstition that you are an object among objects. Without the superstition, you'll see that none of those consequences are real. So how do you free yourself from an existential superstition? You wake up and you wake up gradually and you share your awakening with others who have heard the whispering. So I call it the whispering. Um, in the dedication of Hoodwinked, I say it's for all those who have heard the whispering because the world is loud and the universe is very quiet and you have to still the loud to hear the quiet. There's no other way to hear the quiet than to still the loud. Mm -hmm. So here's one way that somebody expressed that. His name is Henri Bergson. He said, fortunately, some are born with spiritual immune systems that sooner or later give rejection to the illusory worldview grafted upon them from birth through social conditioning. They begin sensing that something is amiss and start looking for answers. Inner knowledge and anomalous outer experiences show them a side of reality others are oblivious to. 
and so begins their journey of awakening. Each step of the journey is made by following the heart instead of following the crowd and by choosing knowledge over the veils of ignorance. I like that one. I've collected a number of quotes uh, that reference that same idea. You can't get to ownership of your life and the kind of power that allows you to live your life your way through rationality and logic. And when you use rationality and logic, you will create problems in the act of trying to solve the ones you're trying to solve. And it goes around and around and around. You have to wake up. That's what we're doing here. We're waking up and we're sharing our awakening with others. I acknowledge you and I thank you because without you, I can't do this. But you're not out there. <laughs> you're in here with me and I'm in here with you. We're all in here. And we project that into an out there that we invented so that we can play together, so that Kay and I can dance, and Jerry and I can play music, and Jan and I could play music together all those years ago. You know, we project it out there so we can dance and play, but it's not real. None of that is real. The only thing that's real is your experience, which happens right here and right now. And the minute you think about it, it's gone. But you can always come back. If the world is not thrilling you the way it shows up, there's one or more superstitions in the way. Let's put it that way. If you're not sad at you, if one is not satisfied in their experience of living in the world, there's one or more superstitions at play. And the way to change those circumstances is to find, uncover, and identify those superstitions. That's all it takes. You don't have to change anything. Just find and identify the superstitions. Yes, sir. Is it also possible that one could just say, I like my life? Yeah. And change the connotation. And, and, and if so, what am I, how does that relate to your talk? How about one of those consequential superstitions being my life is not the way I want it to be? Recognize that as a superstition. It's exactly the way you want it to be. It is exactly the way you chose it to be or you're choosing it to be. Not like there's nothing left to do. There's plenty left to do. My life is exactly the way I want it to be because the situations and circumstances show me the work I have to do. So the idea that my life is not the way I want it to be is a superstition. My ego doesn't like it in certain circumstances, but that's not me. That's a thing. Does that help? Well, I would like to uh, say that Larry is always available to answer these questions. And um, especially if you begin reading the book and you're going, well, wait a minute, you know, I tried to edit it enough so that it was logical and, and readable for all of us. And, um, but if, I'm sure there will be questions that come up. And what do you think it did work? He, he would he wants to have these conversations is what I'm trying to say. He really is eager to get everybody's perspective. So if you do enjoy the book or get get confused by the book, know that he's yeah, available. There talk. were several times when Kay said, I've read this paragraph three times. You need to fix this. <laughs> and we did. Yeah. Well, he has a physicist mind and yeah, I, right. you know, have a layperson's mind. And together we really enjoyed doing this. It was a, a great labor of love. Mm -hmm.